What's up, everybody? We're back here again with Pop at Pop's Corner. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about one of the great powerlifting legends of all time. Sadly, as time moves on, the name gets mentioned less and less, so I think it's our duty to remember a guy who's, who's still living. He's still, he's still out there pushing powerlifting as a sport, but in a day and age where it's media-driven and it's, it's just so fast-paced, um, we, need to, we need to reflect on people like this a little bit, and I'm talking about Larry Pacifico. I think he's just misunderstood as a man in a lot of ways, definitely underappreciated as a lifter, as I said, but to put things into context, I have a couple of world championship titles behind my name. I would say that I have won competitions that were more highly competitive than those world championships. Larry Pacifico won 10 world championships when that was the unified world championship. That was as big as it got in the sport of powerlifting, and that was really the, the beginning or the explosion, if you will, of powerlifting, basically because of the face of Larry Pacifico. How great of a time was it to see that level of athlete, and how awesome was his presence in this world of strength? Well, the fabulous uh, Mr. P, I, I was kind of a fledgling. I was very interested in powerlifting, but I wasn't actually competing. I was training powerlifting, but I wasn't competing at the time. And I kept hearing about Larry Pacifico and a man that had won 10 world championships. How could you dominate a sport like that? And I got kind of interested in it. And a friend of mine uh, from California said, hey, let's take the trip to Dayton, Ohio, and let's see what this national championship is all about. And I said, well, okay, you know, let's get together and do it. Now, today, people just randomly go to powerlifting meets, and it's, it's a small thing sometimes, and it's a, you know, it's a nice event. But I show up at this auditorium, and there's 8,000 people coming to an event. This was like going to a championship boxing match. Well, it, was on, like, it was on ABC Wild World of Sports, right? It was incredible, yeah. They had uh, live music in the background. They had uh, Dr. Ken Leisner many times was an announcer. He was fabulous at that. He knew the sport. He loved it. The people there were... If you were a 242 national champion, you were the only guy. You weren't, there weren't different federations. It was unified. Everybody came probably hating on each other, but they became brothers mm -hmm. during, the, during the meet. And if you won the super heavyweight, you were the dude, you were the guy in America that was strongest. Larry brought this to the light. He promoted it promoted it in the right way, uh, in the largest, best way I've ever seen since. Uh, I felt like I was going on a vacation, going to a special event, uh, concert with, you know, uh, Rolling Stones kind of level excitement. And every year, for a number of years, I went to it. I got to see Moran do his historic squat. I got to, to see some of the most awesome looking people. The giant 275s where they look like dinosaurs. They Doug so Young was a, was a favorite of mine. I, I saw Doug Young lay down. Uh, he, he came out holding his side. He benched 573. He threw up and walked off. And then they found out he had broken ribs before he went into the meet. Yeah. He sucked it up and did it. Larry Pacifico comes out and wins his national championship, and the next day has a heart attack. Right. He was hurting that bad, but he still sucked it up and went to the meet and did it. And plus, a lot of the good lifts he did, he was missing a finger. Yeah. So he was, even in some uh, the deadlift, let's say, he had to be working in a deficit uh, as far as having a grip, but he fought through that. Uh, he, he lives far enough away where we've never been close as far as an association but I have utmost respect for him and his son. Uh, they've always been gentlemen to me. They, they tried to promote the, the goodness in powerlifting. And there was more to just lifting a weight. It was a group of people, one-minded, but together as a brotherhood. I loved it. Do you think, looking back on those days, 
I've heard I've heard conflicting stories. Like I hear the stories about how kind he was, and I hear all you know the good that he's done for the sport. But I also hear that he was a vicious competitor. You know, very very uh, not not necessarily mean or aggressive towards other lifters, but just a focus. Like we talked about, Kaz Meyer's level of focus. Did you see that when you were there watching? Or was I, he always the promoter? Was he always a kind well, of a showman? I saw Larry. It was like a like a group of hummingbirds. You'd see him one place, and he was making sure the platform uh, spotters were right. Then he was checking the equipment out. Then he was putting his suit on. Then he was shaking hands with people in the crowd. Then he was he was everywhere. And still, the moment he came out to lift, on top of all that, he was totally focused. I've never saw him have the level of rage that I've seen in some people mm-hmm. that you do need. Uh, each person gets ready in a different way. Maybe it's music. Maybe it's tranquil. Maybe it's just I would see Kaz, and you didn't go near Kaz, even if you knew him, when he was getting ready because he was in Kaz space. Right. He was doing what he needed to do to prepare to to do his best, and you had to respect that. Uh Larry had been nothing but enthusiastic around me, uh, me observing him or towards me. Um, you know, everyone meets someone in a different manner, and they think about them from the experiences that they have with that person. To me, he was nothing but good to me and good to the sport. He grew the sport to really what it it really could be at that time. And maybe it's never gone back to right. that level. Do you think that sometimes a sport can be some, can become so wrapped up in an individual, let's say a Tiger Woods for golf or a Michael Jordan for basketball, right. there's almost like a deflation when they're no longer a part of the sport or they're no longer lifting at that level. Who picks up the slack? And is it solely on their performance ability? Is it their personality? Is it a culmination of all that? I mean – I know Larry well enough to say he's charismatic, he's, he's been helpful, he's friendly. You know, it was obviously a blow to the sport when he was no longer at his peak level. Yeah. Do you think that he is the personification of powerlifting in a way? I really believe so because he gave up his heart to make it better, mm-hmm. to grow it uh, on so many levels. He was personally involved and also he was helping others along to be their best. Uh, that's a rare combination. Either it's all about me and not about you, but he looked out for kind of everybody. He really did. And, and someone needed to do it. And he was, he was the one. I mean, I, I, I only could report on what I saw and what I experienced. And it was always a very positive thing. Everything was neat. It was done right. It was done professional. They gave... Every person that came out, there was a little story about them. Yeah. You, you were part of their lives for that moment they were on the platform. It wasn't just a number called or a person come up. It was done the right way that I could see. Uh, now, in, uh, when I quit powerlifting in my state, it went from being a state champion to one of 17 state champions in my weight class. That right. means all the different fractions of groups. There were 17 275-pound champions in South Carolina. I said, what does this mean to me? Right. I, I, or I squat 600 and I'm doing it four inches higher than you, but we have the same no. So as I said before about our bars, you have to standardize something to be able to appreciate it. You do. I mean, I'm looking at you going, All right, here's a guy that squats 843 mm-hmm. and can row 1,000 meters. Find somebody. 100,000 meters. 100,000, I'm sorry. <laughs> Find somebody that could do that. Right. I'm impressed because you've diversified and you've done multiple disciplines of excellence. You know, you, you want to be able to say, you can't hang your hat on one person. Looking back, Everyone remembers to this day Babe Ruth, okay? He was a fat guy. He was a hellraiser and everything else. But he had the charisma that put baseball on its feet. It gave people hope. 
He gave back in his own way to children. He inspired people. He lives today. He's still alive. Are there greater athletes today in baseball? Oh, boy, there are. Yeah. Are they paid more? Yes. But there, there's only going to be one Babe Ruth. I was lucky enough to see at the infancy of powerlifting the ones were, that were the great ones. Yeah. The ones that cut the path, that they had nothing to go by, and walked out there and lifted that weight. It was just the, it was kind of the wild west at, at a certain point because I remember hearing about the stories of the the rules meeting where they decided what parallel or breaking parallel Absolutely was. Absolutely a big argument. I mean it was a it was a truly revolutionary time in sports because it was the creation of it. Yes. And then here you have a guy, Larry Pacifico, good looking guy. Um, and I want to talk about that. You know, we've talked about Kaz and the physical presence of that. What did you think the first time that you saw Larry Pacifico walk out on stage? He was an impressive guy. His body was very balanced and solid. You know, he's not an exceptionally tall man, but he had a presence. He didn't have that glowering, fearsome look about him, yeah. but he was 100% business. He was coming there to deliver you the bill you're going to pay. Right. He had that aura of, I'm going to do this, and you're going to see it. And I, you, he almost promised the crowd excitement. I think that's a, a huge compliment in a sport that is so individualized to, to turn it around to where your level of excellence raises the excellence in others because people are coming there to take your crown, to push you to your limit because they're pushing themselves to them, their yeah. limit. Yeah, and he was exposing – now look at it in a real way. He was exposing himself to – be beaten or to be uh, injured and he still manned up enough to run that meet of a se of the, the century and compete in it too you are I mean you are exposing a lot your your flanks to the world and yeah. he still did it what were the most impressive aspects of his lifts that you got to see or that you ever heard about well, I, I, I've read books. Uh, uh, matter of fact, I read his book cover to cover, and I learned, out, I learned a lot about him. Uh, it seemed like he was very organized. He kept his workouts up very carefully. He did plan. He did cycle mm -hmm. training. He did work around his injuries of his lost finger, and he, he was pretty well balanced as far as the lifting. He was, his levers were of sufficient length, even though he was short be decent in everything and that which pulls your big totals you know i think the the one thing that blows my mind is you have guys like mike mcdonald larry pacifico yes. these lighter body weight guys that are putting up numbers i can remember even just five six years ago in the sport of powerlifting in those weight classes there were maybe one or two guys that were even close to the numbers yeah. especially on the bench because larry and, and mike were just they were revolutionizing what a, a smaller man could do for the bench press. I but mean, lo and look at the gear they were wearing. Yeah. They, the, I used to be able, when I finally did get a bench shirt, I could put it on like a, it was a T-shirt. Sure. I could put it on just like, you know, and it had a little stretch to it. Mm -hmm. And that's what they were lifting in. And they didn't have any thick squat suits. It was a thin skin cutting, you know, single ply suit. So, yes, they had things that helped them but not so far that the equipment was lifting it, not the man. Yeah, I think this, the sport really took some – there were steps forward as far as the numbers. There were steps forward in the early days of the, as the gear progressed because of safety. But then just like anything else, maybe it got too far. Uh, Larry advanced the sport through the multiply days. You know, his son Jimmy became yeah. a great multiply lifter. Jimmy was also a very strong – uh, raw lifter. I don't. I don't know that he ever did a raw competition. Maybe one, but um, it was cool to see that Larry evolved with the sport. A lot of people, when they stake their claim in one way, it's it's all about the good old days. And Larry was a visionary. I think in the fact that he didn't try to change the sport. He just tried to change with the sport. And I think. Do you think? Uh, do you think guys like that? or what keep it alive when, when you can bridge those two generations? Well, I see him now training people that are regular people that are wanting to get better, putting his time into people that want, want to be better. Not world champions, but they want to be better. And he, 
he grew, he loved it enough where you have to coax it along and to, to go into uh, thicker suits or better belts or whatever, he was supportive of that. Um, he, was, he was a promoter. He was a promoter of strength. As a sideline, uh, the, the most, excited, most excited I ever saw him, he ran up to me and he knew about my grip and whatever, and he was beaming, just jumping up and down at the Florida Strength Symposium. He goes, I got the guy, I got the guy. I go, Larry, what are we talking about here? What are you? He goes, I got the guy, I got the guy. I said, what guy, what, what are you talking about? He goes, I got the guy, who has strong hands, I got the guy. And he was just jump, and he was jumping out of his suit. And it, it turns out that he figured out with the one, number three gripper I could close, he found the other guy that could do it. Yeah. Who did he drag over? Ed Cohn. <laughs> I, I was just like, uh? Yeah. And Ed Cohn's hands are a good bit bigger than mine. Oh, he yeah. has mitts on him. Yeah. And you talk about strong. Ed is, he made lifting look pretty easy. And Larry was jumping out of his suit, like I said, and hands that gripper to Ed. And Ed looked at it. And he's pretty emotionless when he lifts. Yeah. And I actually got to have a picture, and you could see a vein sticking out of his forehead that he was squeezing that gripper hard enough. And that thing came way down. Yeah. But when it didn't happen, Larry was crushed because, <laughs> not because he cared that much about grip, but he cared that much about strength and mm -hmm. his friends and involving people together. I, from that day on, I knew Ed Cohn. Right. That's the kind of person that Larry was. So if somebody's listened to this, this is their introduction to Larry. If Larry were sitting here or, you know, you could, you could describe Larry to someone and give them the idea of who he was, sum that up for us so, you, so people can really appreciate the guy. It was a man, a man that had greatness personified in something he truly loved to do. And not only for his own gain as far as winning championships to give something to everyone to 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 start to plant a seed and be pretty sure it's going to grow into something good and then be around to see that seed bear fruit i think that was larry and that's bigger than powerlifting that's what we should all be striving for right yes